Okay, so I've been experiencing One Piece and we are at the halfway point, but I've stopped because there's a lot of things that I want to talk about. Just a lot of predictions and even some theories that I'm going to be throwing out. So consider this my bingo card. But first, um, uh, can we talk about this comment that someone left on my Impel Down review? It is a theory by the name of Crocobob. Okay, so as far as I understand it, Crocodile has a secret in Impel Down that nobody knows about except for Eva, and one that Eva is willing to expose. Couple that along with the fact that in Marineford, Crocodile even defends Luffy, and for a lot of people, I guess the conclusion was that it is obvious to them that Crocodile is Luffy's mother. I don't... <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this one. Apparently, like, Eva, Crocodile, Crocodile kind of defend Luffy. It all checks out. It, it's an interesting theory, I guess. Uh, that's not where my head went. My guess was that Crocodile's secret wasn't based on, like, gender or romance or combat, but of status. Crocodile has just fallen from grace like many others down the Grand Line's ladder, and Crocodile, on his way back up, has been searching for an ancient weapon to up his chances, but he hasn't gotten lucky yet, right? Now, Luffy, on his fourth island in the Grand Line, had already accomplished way more than Crocodile had, at least bounty-wise, and had successfully even managed to take Crocodile down at the end of Alabasta. So, how much more depressing would it make it for a character like Crocodile for us to know that even his status as a warlord was invalid? That even after everything he did, the only way that he even managed to become a warlord in the first place was because someone like Eva helped him. That, for me, is my headcanon, and I like it more than Crocobomb. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I like Rockabob actually, but for a different reason. I think this does raise an interesting point though, and that's the fact that motherhood isn't a theme in One Piece. Fatherhood, found family, fathers bearing the responsibilities of their children, uh, just father figures in general, uh, is a core theme in One Piece. But motherhood? It barely even shows up. We have Usopp's mom, that lasted like a page. We have Ace's mom, that lasted like one panel. Uh, Luffy's mom is nowhere to be seen, and the closest we have to motherhood or any sort of mother is Bellamere. Don't get me wrong though, parentless characters in media is a very common trope, but it's weird that father figures are present in the world of One Piece, but not mother figures? Maybe it's because they don't have alliteration. I think a big question in the world of One Piece is where do devil fruits come from and how do they work? I think Blackbeard plays a pretty big role here because he's changed the idea of how devil fruits work. He is able to absorb multiple fruits, but how and why? I don't really like the idea that the black hole fruit is special and is able to absorb multiple fruits, or the idea of him having a twin brother that he like absorbed in the womb and that's what makes him have uh, multiple fruit abilities. I don't really like that idea. At the moment, this is one of the few things that I think breaks the logic of what we currently understand from devil fruits, which makes me question, how do they actually work? I think Whitebeard's death does raise a lot of theories involving Devil Fruits. I think that this moment right here gives us a lot of information. For example, if a user dies, the fruit doesn't necessarily have to generate somewhere else for someone to get it. Do Devil Fruits even have to grow from a tree if the earthquake fruit didn't for Blackbeard to obtain it? I think the extra layer here is that we know that Devil Fruits have or are in some way made up of souls. And what I love is that the fruits have been thematically relevant to the characters that obtain them. So the question I'm having is, is that a meta reason or an in-world reason? What I'm essentially saying is, did Blackbeard obtain the earthquake fruit because the soul of that fruit gravitated towards him? It doesn't need to happen, but I think it would be pretty interesting if the Straw Hat somehow obtained a devil fruit. Like, maybe Nami would try to sell it, or the whole crew would debate on who would eat it. We already know that Sanji wants a specific fruit, which, um, <laughs> yeah, I really, I really hope he doesn't get that one. But I can't think of anyone in the crew who would actually want to eat the fruit. Though, I mean, here's kind of my tier list of who I think would be most probable uh, to eat one. I think that there's a lot of devil fruits that would be pretty interesting to see, and a lot of them have been hinted at in the story. 
In Marineford, we were told about mythical zone types, and immediately I wanted to see a dragon since the cover story has already shown a few dragons. And it made me realize that it's possible that there's already a dragon fruit user. It's it's dragon. Dragon has the dragon has the devil fruit. Okay, wait, hear me out. I'm not just saying that because dragon's name is dragon. Okay, um, in Logtown, we know that dragon might have used electricity here. And while you can say that it's likely that dragon has an elemental fruit like Anel with his electricity, he could also just be wielding a dragon fruit that has an electric element. In a lot of media, elemental dragons are a pretty big cliché. There's water or ice dragons, there's fire dragons, but there's also electric dragons. So you could argue that this dragon here is a mythical Zoan type that's also an electric dragon. And what I like about this is that it also hints at the ability for there to be other elemental dragon fruit users. Um, also, <laughs> also as a side note here from future me, um, Dragon was born on Boa Kingdom, right? So what if Dragon is a celestial dragon? I think that'd be pretty ironic and it would also like tie him to Sabo even closer in the post-wars flashback. Though, um, <laughs> I will be honest, I kind of just came up with that one because Dragon is named Dragon and the celestial dragons have dragon in the name. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how strong that theory is, but there you go. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Whitebeard and Fishman Island. Fishman Island was originally the island that the crew was supposed to reach. Uh, and so my question is, what's going to happen after the two-year time skip? What's going to become a Fishman Island? There is a possibility for nothing to happen... You know, it would be fine, I guess. A lot has changed in two years. But I say this because Whitebeard's rule over Fishman Island is what kept it stable. Without Whitebeard, are we going to see a ton of people going after Fishman Island? And are we going to see Fishman Island as like a now ruined, pillaged island? Because one of the things I really liked about Marineford is how Whitebeard's death after Marineford had a ton of ripple effects throughout the story. And so the big question is, how will this affect Fishman Island as well as any other island that Whitebeard was attached to that the Straw Hats come across? How will everyone react to the Straw Hats after the time skip? There's also been like a ton of other islands that we've been hinted at. Elbaf is a pretty obvious one, the land of giants, and is obviously uh, on my bingo list. In Little Garden, we were also introduced to island eaters with the giant goldfish. I'm just saying it would be pretty interesting to see an arc take place during the consumption of an island where an island is just eaten by a giant sea creature or an arc that takes place inside of a giant sea creature. I like the idea of like a giant whale consuming an island and the crew and we're just stuck inside of a huge whale. <laughs> Wait, hold on. <laughs> That's Laboon. I just, that exists. That's Laboon. All right, so island eaters are pretty interesting, but we've also seen just a lot of other big sea creatures big enough to actually hold islands. You know, the cliche thing would of course be to have a city or just an island on a turtle. What if we went the Shadow of the Colossus slash Breath of the Wild route of having civilizations on top of a flying bird? Because then you can connect the Blue Sea and the White Sea together. Look, I'm just, I'm, I'm just spitballing here. Okay, uh, something that wasn't shown in the anime but was in the manga was at the start of Sabaody, it happened for like one page, not even one page, for like two panels, and that nobody talked about. It rained candy. Are we, are we not going to talk about this? Idea one, it's a sky island and it's revolved around partying and everyone's having a good time and some people drop candy down into the ocean. <laughs> I think that's, that's a pretty moderate one. Okay, a better idea. Idea two, it's a flapjack situation. Come with me, we'll go and see a place called Candy Island. That's weird. But I feel like there's established media that makes this feel more legitimate than just like a random partying Sky Island that's like playing around with candy and they drop some. Anyways, that's weird. Someone's got like a Kainu level element manipulation, uh, except for candy. Candy's an element. I mean, <laughs> Adventure Time taught me that one. Um, let's move on. When the Straw Hats were scattered all over the world, Robin ended up on a bridge. 
island. It's interesting. I have a lot of questions on it. Like one, where does it go? And two, uh, why? My first idea was that it was a form of transportation, like the sea train, maybe going from one government station to another. But then there is the scale of the bridge, which is big enough to hold multiple cities. And yet those cities are purposefully abandoned, I think, with every expansion. Why would you do that? There's no reason to live here. It doesn't have any resources. If it was just for transportation, it doesn't need to be this wide or this big. Can we talk about Skypea? I feel like we need to talk about Skypea. When I reviewed Skypea, I messed up bad. People were commenting, hey, why is Skypea shorter than Jaya? And that's because I didn't have a script. I didn't even have bullet points. It was just off the dome and the dome was not very big. So I have been thinking about Skypea ever since. Not only is it one of my favorite arcs and one of the most fascinating ones, since it also connects the Blue Sea and the White Sea, but it's also the only arc that focuses on like religion as one of its core themes, which is reflected in uh, like the greater emphasis of the story. Ever since Water 7, one of the core themes was the idea that the Straw Hats were going to be the light which would fight the darkness. But they would also be the people who would fight against false gods. In Skypea, it is very literal with an L. And in Ennis Lobby and Marineford, it's more metaphorical with the world government. The floating island literally mimics this by having their own gods, the sun god, rain god, forest god, and land god, which Noland uh, later just goes up there and abolishes in an attempt to save their lives. So I just love this arc and like its overall importance to the story. Seriously, why did, why did people want me to skip this one? It also, oh man, okay, it also just introduces the weirdest of things. In an L's cover story, we learn so many things. Enel connects the Blue Sea, the White Sea, and space? It tells us that one, it's possible to travel to space. Two, you don't need a spacesuit to breathe in space. Three, there's civilizations at war in space. And four, there's also robots. The robot part isn't really as crazy anymore uh, with Frankie introduced. Uh, but there's just like entire cities up there in the moon. And five, you can just float up there with a balloon and reach the moon. Um... And also, I guess six, uh, the Skypean people uh, floated down because it lacked resources for anyone to survive. So we can talk about this one for hours. Uh, <laughs> so traveling to the moon on the bingo card and now eventually coming down with a robot army. I, uh, that's on the list too, I guess. I think this further also connects the fact that the people on the White Sea were originally from space. Oh man, this is also part of it. Okay, uh, so I already had a bunch of theories around Vegapunk, right? Like one in Sabaody and Marineford, Vegapunk and Kuma were a part of the Revolutionary Army, or at least agreed uh, with the Revolutionary Army, and even helped out with the Straw Hats. But I gotta add one more to the list because I just realized while rereading the Skypea section for this video that Vegapunk's Island, Katakuri, was the same island where the robots for Skypea were built, thereby connecting Vegapunk in some way to the Shandians or the moon. Does that mean that Vegapunk is a Shandian? I, do <laughs> I don't know, actually. I wouldn't go that far, but I think at the very least, it could explain why Vegapunk was able to create a lot of interesting stuff. Not just because he's like super big brained, but because he has a lot of tools from the Shandians who already had a ton of interesting technology. Before we talk about hockey, I just want to talk about general power-ups, right? We got Nami with the staff, we got like Usopp with the gizmos, and I think post-war sets Nami up to naturally be able to learn how to use her elemental staff just way more effectively. I think Usopp, on the other hand, is just going to have a ton of gizmos in his satchel that we're not going to be shown for a while. And I say this because I do miss, and I wish there was a little bit more of this, uh, I think it was like right after the start of Little Garden where we saw Usopp making a hot pepper ball. And I would like to see at least one panel of Usopp working with these things. And then we have Luffy and Gear Second. You know, when Gear Second was introduced to Luffy, I was kind of worried. I thought, uh-oh, how is this going to affect the future? Are we eventually going to go down the infinite power scaling route where Luffy is eventually at gear 400? 
I think we're pretty safe, though. I think Gear 2nd and 3rd have had a logic behind them, which mostly makes me think that any other Gear Edition isn't going to be shown like a haha, now it can shoot laser beams kind of thing or whatever. You know, one of the big questions I got at the end of post-war was, hey, what about hockey? I didn't really talk about hockey at the end of post-war, and a lot of people wanted me to. The thing is, uh, I don't have a lot of info on it. While it wasn't planned, I'm really glad that hockey just managed to tie a lot of things together in a nice way to create a very thematically resonant power system. But I do have uh, some concerning questions regarding hockey, and I'm curious to see how it's going to play out. So my biggest concern is how hockey is going to affect the engagement of the story. Armament hockey is essentially hit stuff harder or be more defensive, but I don't know what that will contribute to the depth of the combat. I think an interesting thing about armament hockey is just how it levels the playing field. We saw that with Silvers and Kizaru. Conquerors hockey is another weird one where it essentially just gets rid of the fluff. Conquerors hockey has uh, essentially become a way to eliminate low-level enemies, and I don't know how it's going to contribute to the overall fight of the story. I think observation hockey has the potential to be the most interesting one. It creates a unique fighting style around hockey, and we saw it being used with an L. I think predicting your opponents has the most opportunity for interesting combat, especially when you have two people that actively have that ability fighting each other. While it's more thematically interesting, I think the problem is that it's not nearly as interesting as Devil Fruits, but I think the combination of both of them are where we can see a lot of potential, and so for me, it just really depends on how things play out. So after I finished Sabaori, there was a comment saying that I should make the predictions on what I think is going to happen with the 11 rookies. And I did right after I finished Sabaori. And then post-war happened and it changed everything. So one of the things that I heard about from the rookies that I think might affect how I think about this from a meta story perspective is that I heard that the rookies were added in last second. And so my question is, how much can they actually affect the story? Okay, so there are two categories that I'm going to put these rookies in. Uh, the first category is, are these characters even going to be used for anything? First up, we got Capone, a non-pirate pirate. I think he was a really interesting addition because he adds a mafia story into a pirate story. And the cover pages love putting the straw hats in these outfits. Of course, the problem now is that uh, the UFO happened. And is Capone ever coming back? I don't know. Maybe we can have a story where like the straw hats are given a task of saving Capone in exchange for a favor that they might need. While I don't even know what you would do with a rogue, what I find interesting is that you can connect them to the blue and white sea, as well as connect them with either Anel or Capone, giving him a lot of possibilities. After I finished Sabaody, for X Drake, I'm gonna be honest, I had, I had nothing. But after post-war, I think he just went to like go upset Kaido. So are we gonna see Kaido just like a lot sooner than we think? Are we going to hear about Kaido just doing some damage after Drake seemingly poked the bear? Moving on, we got the band kid. Um, I don't remember his name. You know the band kid. <laughs> I don't know what story you could use him for. I had like the least amount of info about this guy. Uh, but what I find interesting is that Brooke and the band kid are both musicians. And I feel like that would allow you to really just have a story where you could sneak onto an island and perform or whatever. I'm going to be honest, here's where I'm just diving off the deep end. Look, the band kid and Brooke can even connect because I guess you could say that they were both captains and musicians. Maybe because of their musician abilities, they can make a distraction while the crew goes on and does something else on the island. I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. And Basil. Basil. I completely forgot about this guy. I'm reading right here that I only remembered him because he's in my notes from Sabaody, and that's right. I don't even... Well, who is Bazil? Oh, he's the magician guy. Okay. Yeah, uh, what, it, what is Basil's purpose in the story? If anything, Basil feels like a villain role specifically from his Devil Fruit ability alone. 
either being the antagonist or fueling the antagonist. But why and where? I don't really know, since there's not much to work with with this guy. Next up, I have a category called Actually Possible Predictions. First up, we got Law Killer, Luffy, and Zoro. They're all being lumped in together. Why? Because both of these have one captain and one first mate, and there are a lot of parallels here. We also have one fruit user and one uh, blade wielder. I don't know if you'd consider these swords. And I think an interesting concept from this would be seeing one of them fail while the other one proceeds. I think with Marineford, we saw Luffy get saved by law. And so I think it would be pretty interesting to see the inverse with Luffy now being the one who saves law. Next up, we got Kid, who, unlike Law, Kid also feels like an antagonist to Luffy. Not only are they both after the One Piece, but Kid himself is not against murder and complete destruction to get it. He reminds me a lot of Blackbeard in a way. Like, I can see him either being helpful competitive, like in Sabaody, or just completely backstabbing Luffy and being like, Haha, thanks for doing all the grunt work with this guy. And lastly, we got my favorite, Bonnie. Bonnie draws a lot of strong parallels to Luffy. She's helpful, saving Zoro. Both of them are gluttonous people. The only difference is Bonnie's self-awareness for self-preservation, which Luffy just completely ignores. And unlike Luffy or the rest of the rookies, doesn't actually have a gimmick. She's just a pirate without a devil fruit. Uh, now though, uh, <laughs> yeah, who knows? She might be dead. Uh, Bonnie was handed over to Akainu at the end of post-war for a ship, and she doesn't even have a crew with her. So either she's gone, or she's an impel down, or she escaped somehow. And then, uh, and then what? She's just like lost. <laughs> what I do know is that post-war Bonnie is not up for a good time. You know, I didn't really mention the Emperors of the Sea. For half of the story, we have been focused on Whitebeard and Shanks, and that took half of the story. And Kaido and Big Mom are just hardly in this section. Well, Kaido hasn't been seen, we got to see a lot about him. One of the rookies was after Kaido, he got to take down a warlord, and also challenge two emperors. So I love that we're hyping him up and ready to put him to use after the time skip. And as for Big Mom? Well, we haven't seen her at all. We've gotten like two lines of dialogue on her and, and that's about it. So I'm really interested in her. What I'm noticing though is that if the death of Whitebeard and the war in Marineford created an entirely new era, are we also going to see that for Kaido and Big Mom and Shanks' downfall? I think it's more likely that instead of another titan falling and getting three more eras, we're instead going to see a shift in the world, perhaps destroying the entire concept of emperors. Which leads us to this, I had to talk about this in some shape or form, the final question, what is the One Piece? Here's what I find interesting from what we know about it so far. In Marineford, we know that not anyone can access the One Piece. It's most likely going to be a D member who is said to carry someone's will, and Blackbeard is not it. The story has told us that it's not just an object like gold, but it's a concept or an idea. And that's why Blackbeard can't have it. He's not one who can achieve this idea. And while I'm not saying that the One Piece is only an idea, I at least think that obtaining the One Piece is going to coincide with the creation of a new era and perhaps the destruction of the concept of emperors as well as the marines and celestial dragons as we know them. Or maybe uh, the One Piece is just, uh, they're my patrons. Whoa, what a, what a twist. <laughs> <laughs> what if the one Pi what if the one piece just didn't exist and Roger's just doing the ultimate prank you open up a chest it's a whoopee cushion it says ha I got you um he pulled a Noland